Welcome to Geography is Everything, because, Hunter? Well, geography relates to just about everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's probably a fun exercise at some point that we should take to actually figure out what maybe geography doesn't apply to. I'm sure we could come up with something. I think most of the things that we're interested in talking about <laughs> fall into the realm of geography. So maybe that's why we think it's everything. You know, I, I, I was actually thinking about this a little bit the other day as I was, you know, thinking about this new concept that we're working with. And I was like, it would be fun to do an episode on Mars. But is Mars geography? <laughs> well, I mean, geography references, geo references the Earth. So Right, exactly. I mean, there is spatial aspects to Mars, but I, it might need a new name. Yeah, uh, Marsography is everything. Something like that. <laughs> or whatever, I guess, the Greek word for Mars was, because I think Mars is Roman. Whatever. Well, welcome to the show. We are here. We are back again recording. Hunter and I are recording this the day after daylight savings time switch. So it's actually an hour earlier. So I I'm, I was taken by surprise by it this morning. I'm a little more tired than I expected <laughs> to be. But we are here. We're recording. We'll go ahead and just do some quick introductions, Hunter. Hello, I'm Hunter Shobi. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I'm the co-author of two books with my colleague, David Bannis. They are Portlandness, a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. And of course, I am co-host of this podcast and co-host of the Substack operation that we're starting to run now, too. Yeah, right on. Yeah. And my name is Jeff. You might know me from my YouTube channel, Geography by Jeff, where I do a bunch of other geography things, geography videos. They're really fun to watch. You can find those at youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff, all sort of one word. And I, I used to make this clarification and maybe I should do it again, but just so people are super duper clear, uh, the way I spell my name is G-E-O-F-F. <laughs> so, you know, don't, don't, don't search Jeff, Jeff as a, as a J. Although that said, all of these links are now inside the show notes. So you actually don't have to remember that at all. Like Hunter said, we both have a Substack newsletter that is now sort of part of this whole podcast world that we are starting to create. The geography is everything extended universe for, for Marvel fans out there. No, it's, it's just a place for us to sort of write a little bit more about geography and host some, maybe some smaller exclusive content over there for our people who are really super duper fans of ours. And you can find that just at geographyiseverything.substack.com. But again, those are also in the show notes. So you don't really need to remember so long as you know how to get to whatever app you're using show notes. And I think that varies based on app. The only other thing I want to mention before we sort of introduce today's topic is, you know, as usual, we're, we're always looking to get more people to review us on Apple Podcasts. So Hey, if you're liking what you're you're hearing today and you you think that, you know, Hunter and I are fun to listen to and you're learning stuff, please please review us. We would super duper appreciate it. Yeah. And with that, let's get to the to the topic. Hunter, let's go for are, it. What are we talking about today? Well, today the topic is skyscrapers. Geography is skyscrapers. Yeah, exactly. Geography is skyscrapers. And just to give a little bit of a teaser, not 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 dive too too far in. We have about an hour worth of worth of episode today. But why skyscrapers, Hunter? Well, there's a lot that gets built into skyscrapers other than concrete and steel and other other materials that we'll talk about. There is a lot of geographical spatial stories we can tell about skyscrapers. And some of them relate to wealth and mm -hmm. affluence. Some of them relate to aspirations for wealth and influence, for power. And there is an interesting geography of how skyscrapers originated in one part of the world and then spread from there to other parts of the world. So there's a lot of interesting spatial geographic stories to tell about skyscrapers. Yeah, absolutely. I think most people are pretty, you know, if you, if you live in a city, you're probably pretty accustomed to your city skyline. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and what that means, because, you know, there's a lot of symbology built into almost every city's skyline these days. That said, I want to make a quick sort of point of clarification here that this is not to be confused with an episode on cities. This is not a geography of cities episode that that will come at some point. But it's worth pointing out that skyscrapers and cities are often conflated with one another. You know, obviously, Skyscrapers exist within cities, but that doesn't mean that a skyscraper is sort of the embodiment of what a city is. A city has a million more different aspects to it. Just one slice of, of what we can talk about when we talk about cities. 
Right. And at some point, you know, there'll be probably be episodes on, you know, geography is stadiums, geography is, you know, and then aspects of cities, right? Like I obviously I have a few transportation ideas cooking in the old in the old head. So, you know, we'll we'll do we'll do different episodes about various aspects of cities as in addition to maybe a larger one at some point. But I do think probably more than anything else, skyscrapers often get. I don't know just tied to two cities in, in a way that few other things really, truly do. So we're going to be talking a lot about skyscrapers today. Um, we're not going to be talking necessarily about specific cities, although we will obviously talk about skyscrapers within specific cities, just a, a point of clarification. So with that, let's move on to sort of, and this is something that we, we, we've been doing a little bit more of. Hunter's episodes are usually a little bit better about it than mine, but which is just running through some terminology, which is always a good thing because, you know, a lot of these a lot of what we talk about has, you know, their own sort of industry words or or industry definitions for for what what qualifies as something. And, you know, as it turns out, Hunter, the skyscraper industry is no different. So let's let's talk about some terminology first. So the, the, the first the term skyscraper was first applied to buildings that really had two qualifications. And that is one that is a steel frame and was at least 10 stories tall. Now, obviously, Hunter, we, we know that 10 stories today is is. That's not a, that's not a super tall building. Today. Nobody would call that a skyscraper today. <laughs> right. So it's worth pointing out that, you know, as, as we're talking about skyscrapers, and as we get deeper into our, our discussion of skyscrapers that, and, and it's, we're, we're going to try and hit on this as we, as we go through, but the definition is going to change and be adapted. And so we'll make note of that as, as much as possible, as much as we remember, but just know that, you know, skyscrapers, you know, and steel frame construction buildings, you know, at one point were were much smaller than they are. And, you know, this is almost like it's just it's just an aspect of sort of, you know, a skyscraper, you know, back then 10 stories was actually pretty mammothly tall. It wasn't that long ago that, you know, having a multi storied building was fairly uncommon. And so the, the I just have here inside my notes, the the, the definition of of a, of a skyscraper is, is based on a steel skeleton as opposed to sort of the, you know, I guess, you know, if you go back a little bit farther, there was construction that was sort of load bearing masonry, which would be like bricks, which really passed their practical limit. in I have here in my notes in, in 1899, which with Chicago's Monod, Monodnock building, I, I might have mispronounced that, but Monodnock building. And so that that's again, and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about different sort of technologies later around taller buildings that aren't steel. But really, if you go back, you know, 100 years or so ago, the the buildings sort of fell along two different sort of sizes. You would have wood frame sort of buildings, and those would only be a few stories tall. And then once it reached a certain point, if you wanted to go higher, you would have to do mason masonry building. And until sort of the steel frame building came into play, you could only build so high because each one of those wood and, and masonry had an upper limit of how much weight could physically support or how much yeah, how much they could physically support weight. So let's get into now. And Hunter, I'll let you lead this sort of discussion of sort of, well, What's a skyscraper today? Well, so there's a few things we can talk about. First of all, as you mentioned, it's a skyscraper is now defined as uh, something that's over 150 meters tall. Right. That's tall. That's pretty tall, right? And so the, I guess another requirement is that I'm seeing in my notes is that at least 50% of their height must be habitable. So that, you know, more at least half of it has to be where people can occupy that can office or residence or restaurant or whatever. Yeah, and I think I think that that qualification came because at one point there was and you know as we talk about sort of terminology, you know there's a there's a certain amount of arbitrariness in all of this that we're we're talking about. But these are organizations that are you know they might be industry organizations. They're they're sort of establishing this to the amount that it really matters. Sort of depends on sort of how much you really care about it. But I think there there was a certain point where you know, people were claiming sort of to have, you know, a really tall skyscraper for something like a an a antenna pole that was sort of, you know, maybe 100 feet taller or something like that. And so that that's sort of where some of these qualifications started to come into play. Yeah. And so what one of the places where we were able to get quite a bit of information about this is an organization called the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, or the CTBUH. And that's headquartered in Chicago, which is significant because skyscrapers really originated in Chicago. The first ones mm -hmm. arose in Chicago. And this organization has three different criteria for measuring the height of a building because that there's some variations here. So one is the height to the architectural top. And so that is from the lowest level pedestrian entrance 
to the top of the building, which includes spires, which are not inhabitable, mm-hmm. but excludes things like flagpoles and antenna, things like that. So that's, that's one way of measuring things. Another way of measuring the height of skyscrapers is the height of the highest occupied floor. So that wouldn't include the spires or anything like that. The highest floor in which people can occupy, not where they can go to fix things, but where they can work or live or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then there's another category, which is height to the tip, which is the highest point of the building, which includes antenna, flagpoles, technical equipment or something like that. So those, you know, you can get into a debate over height based on those three things because things might get ranked differently based on that criteria. There used to be a fourth criteria up into 2009, which was the height of the roof. But many contemporary skyscrapers don't have flat roofs. And so determining where the roof is and where that should be was so contentious that they've just eliminated that particular category in 2009. And now that there are skyscrapers that are much taller than 150 meters, there's a couple more categories too for us to consider. One is super tall, which seems pretty pretty amorphous, right? <laughs> but that's something that's over 300 meters tall. And then there's the mega tall, which is which- twice as tall as a super tall or the, the bottom threshold for super tall. That's over 600 meters tall. And I believe there's only maybe four of those or something like mm-hmm. that in the world. So that's not super common at this point, but there are some buildings that fall into that that category. Yeah, and I would bet everybody listening to this podcast at least knows of one mega tall skyscraper just because it's so famous. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I, I agree, you know, as we're, as we're talking about all of these different terminologies, Hunter, you know, there's very specific, you know, architectural heights and, you know, like all these different, like very specific terms. And then we get to sort of qualifications, just how tall something is. And it's like super tall and mega tall, which sounds just so just like almost like whimsical for an industry that <laughs> that is, you know, right, that deals with such exacting <laughs> sort of yeah, measurements. Exactly. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just funny. Yeah. Come up with something like uber tall or I don't know, something else will come next. I'm really sure what where they go. Yeah. You know, that that's a good point. I think, you know, especially as we get to maybe, you know, as we get to maybe what could potentially be the tallest building here, I'm, there might be a new classification that's needed for that. And, and we can talk a little bit about that in a little bit as well. But I think overall, you know, and this is not necessarily skyscraper. The term is not necessarily supposed to be conflated with the term high rise, which I do think happens quite often. And in fact, I I remember, you know, as a kid talking, you know, obviously, you know, I, I think kids you know, talk about a lot of different things. But I, I remember as a kid, you know, having like conversation you know, with other kids, you know, about, you know, high rises and skyscrapers, just tall buildings in general, right? Kid, kids talk about this, you know, kinds of things like that. And I remember noting like, oh, like, you know, some people were calling it high rises and some people are calling it skyscrapers. And I, I was sort of taking this as like, you know, just a difference in sort of like, you know, well, you know, it has two different words, right? You know, maybe it's like a people from, you know, this area, you know, call it this thing, maybe like a regional dialect kind of thing. And so I was actually kind of surprised to find that high rise actually does have a different meaning entirely. And so something can be a skyscraper and a high rise, and it's really just a high rise as any building that's over 10 floors. And so true to, I guess its name, you know, it's a, it just, it's a building that's rises high. And so that can include, you know, wood frame, it can include, include masonry, it can include, you know, basically any other materials that might exist out there, so long as it hits that 10 floor. Obviously, skyscrapers that we've already established, you know, that's much higher, it, it's, it's much taller. So, and so I think, you know, as as we've talked a little bit about sort of the definition terminologies behind sort of, you know, well, what, what is a skyscraper today? You know, it's fun to just sort of maybe mention that your city that you're living in right now, unless you're living in a few key ones, probably doesn't actually have that many skyscrapers. So I have in here, you know, my notes, if you know, if you if you live in Phoenix, you actually technically don't have a skyscraper. You have tall buildings, you have you have high rises, but Phoenix's tallest building, it comes in at 483 feet, which is well, that's about nine feet shorter than the definition, the definition of a skyscraper at 492 feet, which I just think is really interesting because, again, as we, you know, I think skylines have become very symbolic for a lot of people. And as we're going to get to here in a, in a minute, you know, skyscrapers have a lot of historic meaning and sort of became a very prominent way of displaying sort of wealth and prominence. Promoting a city. Right. Promoting a city. Absolutely. For for Hunter and I, we're, we're here in Portland and Portland only has four skyscrapers, though I don't think that's taking into account. We have a new one that's going up and I'm not sure how tall our new building is going to be. But as of today, for open buildings, we only have four. And so 
you know, various cities have more or less. I, I did I did a bit of research poking around at various cities, but I would just encourage you, a listener, you know, whatever your city you're you're in or wh- whatever your nearest city is, you know, maybe look at a picture of the skyline, and then go actually see how many of those buildings are actually skyscrapers. Because unless you know, I would argue, unless you're in you know maybe again a few key cities in the U.S., I would I would probably say there's most of those buildings are probably not skyscrapers. And I think with that, let's go ahead and just jump into some history. Hunter, do you want to kick us off with some some history here? Sure. Well, you know, talk. You've already mentioned that there's certain technological moments that had to arrive before a skyscraper could even exist in the first place, because as you said, there's limits to what you can do with. You know, load bearing walls made out of concrete and those kinds of things. So it really took the innovation of steel frame construction in order to be able to create the kind of height that we are talking about when we're talking about what a skyscraper is today. And so the steel industry is a really important part of this conversation. And, you know, steel is part of the story of the industrial revolution, part of the story of industrialization as well. And so it's interesting that. If we talk about Chicago, which we need to talk about a little bit right now, because that's mm-hmm. the place where steel frame sort of came online and, and these buildings started to be constructed. Chicago went from being a very, very small place to a very big city in 40 or 50 years in the middle of the 1800s. And so that story of the industrialization of Chicago speaks to the growth of this thing called the skyscraper. Yeah. And I think what, when we're when we're talking about the steel industry and sort of like this, this, yeah, I guess, technological imp- improvements, for, for lack of a better term, around steel, you know, there's a very famous photo and I believe it's of New York, not Chicago, but, but there's a very famous photo of sort of like construction workers sitting at the top of a building and you know, they're eating lunch or something. And what, what they're sitting on is a steel beam. I mean, it's really those steel beams that that we're talking about as sort of the, the technological improvement. But prior to the Industrial Revolution, they could make steel, but making steel of that sort of weight of that, you know, form was not possible. And so it really was that, that when, when we're talking about sort of the steel industry, it was really that sort of improvement that enabled all of this growth. Like you said, sh- Chicago grew, you know, from, from, and this happened to a lot of different cities, but grew so much over, you know, 40 or 50 years, just sort of, da, 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 you know, buildings popping up left and right. Those famous photos that you're talking about that I think a lot of people can recall from memory of workers eating lunch on a steel Mm -hmm. beam high above New York City, those were not candid shots. Those were those were posed shots to promote the construction of the building. (laughs) I mean, it's not I mean, that kind of thing may have happened, but it wasn't that a photographer just happened upon these people and took the picture. Mm -hmm. But those were carefully crafted to promote what was going on. Yeah. But then, Hunter, there was another thing that sort of was required <laughs> for for these buildings to actually be useful and functional, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you're talking about something that's over 10, 20, 30 stories, and you're thinking about how you're going to access the higher floors, it becomes difficult to want to climb up 30 flights of stairs, right? I mean, I would say impossible. So, right. right. <laughs> so and to move things into these buildings so that, that you can furnish them and all that kind of technology. And so the the elevator is a really essential part of the construction of a skyscraper. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have it here in, in my notes is just sort of like a, an aside, but like, not really, but, you know, in, in a certain light, this could almost, this episode could almost be reframed as, you know, geography as the elevator, right? Because so many of the buildings today, you know, you're, you're even thinking, you know, I think you mentioned 30 stories before, but. You know, if you're thinking 10 stories, that that's a pretty monumental effort to climb 10 stories. You know, there's, and I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think in New York, there's a lot of buildings that are what, like four stories, five stories that are just walk-ups. That's right. Um, and that, you know, a four-story or five-story walk-up, that, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of a big lift. <laughs> that's a commitment. Yeah. yeah. You know, I lived in an apartment here in Portland that was only four stories tall and I had an elevator. <laughs> Although sometimes I did take the stairs, but you know, I think the point of clarification here is we don't necessarily need to spend so much time on the elevator, but it's just that, you know, elevators really did, you know, it was an enabling technology, right? It really did enable everything else that we're talking about today. And, you know, I, I have, I have in my notes sort of one of the early uses of, of elevators was not actually for, for buildings, but was rather used for mining and coal mining. Is that, is, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting, Hunter. <laughs> 
So I've got something that goes back a little bit further than that, the use of oh. elevators. And so yeah. remember elevators previously were powered a lot of times by, by, by people, for example, and so there'd be a pulley system or something like that. Oh yeah, that. yeah, that makes sense, yeah. I mean, like at and, a certain point, like pulleys are just, I mean, yeah, pulleys are, are fundamentally, you know, very cool and allows, you know, something to be like, you know, that's very heavy, you know, pulled up with relatively low strength, but didn't right. require necessarily, you know, power generation, electricity generation. That's yeah. right. And so one of the places where you could find an elevator circa 80 AD or common era CE oh, wow. <laughs> would be the Roman Colosseum because there are apparently about 25 elevators in the Roman Colosseum that were used for raising animals to the floor of the Colosseum. And they could support about 600 pounds, which apparently is the weight of about two lions. And that could be lifted some 23 feet, powered by up to eight individuals. And so, you know, this isn't the kind of elevator that we're thinking of. But if you think about the Roman Colosseum, there, you know, how did they get these animals there? And this is a whole different thing as well, a yeah. whole different topic. But it's interesting to think that, you know, the Colosseum is a big central part of the city. And that the way that that operated and the way that we think about what went on there was also a little bit dependent on elevators as well. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I guess maybe not surprising. I feel like, you know, the, the ancient Romans did invent a lot of different things that we sort of take for granted today, <laughs> including probably granite. <laughs> well, so, but when we're talking about the kind of elevators that you would need in, uh, uh, in a skyscraper in a large building, you couldn't have something where people were pulling it or you needed mm -hmm. something that had some security uh, attached to it as well. So there was, in 1852, there was something called the safety elevator, which was invented. And the safety elevator is one where if the cable that's hoisting the, you know, the, the box were to break, that the cab wouldn't fall to the bottom floor. And so that's really what it took to have some, that innovation for that kind of safety in order to, to operate an elevator in a building. And the person who invented this is the, has the name, was named Elijah Otis. And so the Otis elevator is something that probably people see because the Otis elevator company still exists today. It's got its headquarters in Framingham, Connecticut, and it's the world's largest manufacturer of vertical transportation systems. So that includes escalators and a bunch of other things as well. Otis displayed one of these safety elevators at a world's fair and dramatically was on the lift himself and then cut the cable and then it just dropped like a foot or two and then it was okay. And this was to try to convince people that this was viable technology that could mm. be used, that people could trust. And the first was first one was installed in a building, I believe in New York in 1857. And so this is an interesting thing. There's there's one other thing I want to mention about the elevators though. And there's a couple things that I think that's important to mention. One is that Originally, with taller buildings, like you were saying before the skyscraper, the very wealthy would live at the bottom because nobody wanted to walk up all those stairs. And so that it was right. the, you know, it was the poor people who would have to schlep all the way up to the top and the, the wealthier people who were at the bottom. The elevator reversed that hierarchy. So all of a sudden, you know, being at the top, which is symbolically hierarchical and then having the views mm -hmm. and all that was made possible by the elevator. So that social hierarchy, which follows, you know, an actual physical hierarchy was enabled by the elevator. And then the other thing to consider is that, you know, really tall buildings have to have multiple elevators and they don't go all the way from, a lot of times they don't go from the ground floor to the top. They go to what's called the sky lobby and then there's a change and then you go over to another bank of elevators. And that's also to make things practical so they don't get tied up. But all those elevator shafts take up a lot of space in a building. So it really complicates skyscraper design. So as skyscrapers are designed, accounting for where to place the elevators and how mm -hmm. to make that economical in terms of space was a really important thing. So yeah, yeah, the elevator, really critical for the invention of skyscrapers. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you, if you see a, a new, I mean, it doesn't necessarily even technically need to be a skyscraper, but any building that's going to have an elevator in it, you'll see, you know, as they're a sort of. I don't know, building out the foundation, what have you, that the first things that they are building is those wherever the elevators are going to be. So that sort of there's, there's usually like one or two sort of I don't know, 
concrete tubes or something that'll sort of be built up a few stories ahead of everything else. And it's I think it's exactly for what you just said, Hunter. So we are about to launch into just a little bit of history around skyscrapers and in, in mostly inside the U.S. But before we do that, Hunter, let's do time for an ad break. Ads. Yeah, it's time for some ads. So we will be right back. And we're back talking about skyscrapers. So when we we sort of left off sort of talking about the history of the steel industry and the elevators, now we're going to launch into maybe some specific cities or, or I guess examples of cities, sort of where some of these first skyscrapers were built. And so, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, certainly over here in the U.S., you know, we think of, you know, one city when we think about skyscrapers, and that would be New York City. But New York, maybe as as we've already sort of alluded to, was not the first city to get you know, an actual skyscraper. In fact, it was Chicago. You know, Hunter mentioned earlier that, you know, Chicago over the course of, you know, 40 years was really, you know, popping up, you know, buildings left and right. And so in 1889, Chicago actually had the first skyscraper based on that older definition. And so this was a building, it was the Rand McNally building, and it was built, and it was about 148 feet tall, or I think exactly 148 feet tall. I don't know about the you know, differences between architectural height, but that I don't even know if they had those definitions back then. Now, that said, um, well, we could talk a lot about Chicago, and we're going to revisit Chicago. I think it... it I think we got to jump over to New York City. Hunter, you want to talk a little about New York City? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it looks like I'm looking at some information here about... The, the tallest building in the world over time. And in Chicago, at one point, the Home Insurance Building had that crown in 1885. But then in 1890, the World Building in New York City took over there. And then from 1890 to it looks like about 1974, there were a series of buildings in New York that were the tallest building in the world. And so there was sort of an unofficial competition, I think, within developers and builders in New York to, to take this, this prestigious title of having the tallest building. And it went to the Manhattan Life Building, 1894, the Park Row Building, 1899, the Singer Building in 1908, the Woolworth Building, which is a very famous design. And so the other thing that, you know, we could start to mix in and when, when people, when when people talk about skyscrapers, they're not only talking about height, but they're talking about different design eras as well. Oh, absolutely. And this era where, you know, the Chrysler building, for example, which came up in 1930, has, you know, sort of st stood the test of time in terms of the, the approval that architects and people have given it for its, its Art Deco design. The Bank of Manhattan building in 1930, and then the Empire State Building in 1931 held that title for quite some time. And, you know, growing up just outside of New York, that building sort of loomed yeah. pretty large as well in terms of reputation. I would uh, say it still does. It right? still I mean, does. Like and, it's it's still like the 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 number I think it's the stat I had was like it was the number number one most photographed building, at least in, in, in the United States. So and it's it's not the tallest building anymore, but it's it's still just so iconic. The very um, iconic in, in the Chrysler design. building as well. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Then it was in 1972, One World Trade Center, which of course doesn't exist anymore, mm -hmm. became the tallest building in the world, one of the Twin Towers. And then we move out of New York back to Chicago in 1974 when the Sears Tower was constructed. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and before we before we jump back over to Chicago, yes, I just had this this really just to maybe just emphasize how quickly some of these buildings were popping up here. So. If we go back to the Chrysler building, and we talked about this inside our New York City episode a little bit, but there there was like there was an unofficial but you know sort of well known race of you know who's going to have the tallest building during you know this period of time, and it was really between the Chrysler building, which was built by Walter Walter Chrysler, you know of, of Chrysler you know automobile, and and the the Manhattan Manhattan Company building, which is the Bank of Manhattan, and so we That's you right. had mentioned both of those, and so there was sort of a, a race to see who who was going to be tallest. Obviously, well, I guess maybe not obviously, but. The Chrys Chrysler building ultimately won that race. However, while this was sort of, you know, much, much was sort of made about this during the time, you know, this sort of race and, you know, these, you know, titans of Wall Street or what have you building up these, you know, buildings. 
the Empire State Building, and I have here in my notes, this is from the, the book Neil or Hire by Neil Bascom. The Empire State Building appeared really more or less out of nowhere, rising up in a year and a half to win the contest that everyone thought was really between these two other buildings, which is just really sort of, I think it's just interesting. I think it just really paints a really clear picture of one, buildings were always getting taller at this point. And two, nobody, I guess, you know, I guess now we know the Empire State Building did hold on to that, that title for a little while. But during this specific time, nobody was really holding on to the title for, for very long. And so that's just really, it's just really interesting. Okay, so that, now, now let's jump back over to Chicago, which with, I think, the building you're going to talk about, which is pretty. Right. So the Sears Tower in 1974 took that crown back uh, from New York. And if, but if we move ahead much further we find that the tallest buildings in the world, the tallest skyscrapers are, are no longer in the United States. And in 1998, the Petronas Towers were constructed in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, becoming the largest, the tallest buildings in the world. And that was true until I think 2004, based on my notes, when Taipei 101 was constructed. And then that was eclipsed just six years later when what is now the tallest building in the world was completed. And that is the Burj Khalifa, which was finished in 2010 in Dubai. Yeah. And I think what, if you're, and maybe not everybody knows what each of these, these buildings look like. Obviously I do, because I've done a lot of research now, but you know, if you look at the towers that, you know, obviously let's start with the, the Chrysler building, you know, Chrysler building was very iconic, very, had, had very, you know, I guess iconic look. Empire Building, Empire State Building, also very iconic, unique design. You know, the Sears Tower, Willis Tower, you know, maybe, maybe not quite as iconic, although I can still definitely picture it. But, you know, as you jump over to Kuala Lumpur and then Taipei and then the Burj Khalifa, these are all have very specific design styles. These are not, these are not, for lack of a better term, just a, a glass tower. They, the architectural intention behind them was very clear, right? These very were not... different from the twin towers in New York, exactly. the World Trade Center, which were you know, giant rectangles, right? I mean, there was right. not much adornment there. I mean, it kind of reflected the the building style of the time and, you know, what was coming out of the 1950s and 60s. And as you're pointing out, the skyscrapers that are the tallest ones today and some of the ones that aren't the tallest but are still very tall have very different innovative designs. Right. And there's a reason for that that we're going to get to in a little bit. But let's start talking a little bit about skyscrapers today. We're already starting to talk about sort of some modern day sky skyscrapers such as the Burj Khalifa. And so I have here in my notes, so this is going back to our, our friends at the Council of Tall, Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. And this is just an, a sort of a fun, sort of maybe astonishing fact, but between 1930 and 2010, so that's 80 years, the first 50 skyscrapers in the world were built. There. And then the time period between 2010 and 2015, 2015, 50 more were built, right? So the astonishing speed at which buildings were being built, mostly in Asia, and that's kind of where we're seeing a lot of these, these buildings being built, was, was really incredible. Now, granted, this is based on the modern definition that we ran through earlier in this episode, not that older definition. So I don't have the statistic right in front of me, but you know, obviously, if we were using that older definition, there would be a lot more buildings having, having been built. So this would be any buildings you know, that would be, let me go back to my notes, 493 feet tall, 492 feet tall, but still, I, I think pretty incredible. And I think it speaks to, you know, sort of maybe the, the shift in power and wealth, maybe not shift, maybe that's the wrong word, but certainly the power and wealth growing in, in, in Asia, China, and, and even Japan and, you know, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and, and Taipei and, and Taiwan and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. So it turns out to speak to this point that you're making from the 1930s to the 1970s, more than 90% of the skyscrapers in the world were in North America, 90%. By the 18, 1980s, 1990s, that dropped to about 80% in North America. It's still quite a lot. By the first decade of the 2000s, more than half the skyscrapers were outside of North America, most of them in Asia. And then by the 2010s, more than 75% of the skyscrapers were outside of North America, roughly split between Southwest Asia, which is sometimes called the Middle East, but we'll call it Southwest Asia, and, and the rest of Asia. So that's a pretty dramatic change in a fairly small amount of time. Yeah, no, it's it's incredible. And, you know, this... One, this isn't this kind of, you know, growth trajectory isn't I wouldn't say isn't atypical for 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 any sort of business or, or I guess industry. Right. 
there's always going to be that certain point where, you know, whatever it is takes off and sort of hits you know a bit of an exponential growth curve. That's what every industry wants. And, you know, the, the skyscraper building industry is, as it turns out, an actual industry. And so in a lot of ways, this is sort of what a lot of companies and, you know, sort of the capitalism system w w was gearing for anyways. And I, that's just a sort of important caveat that this isn't this isn't different from a lot of different businesses. However, what gets wrapped up into skyscrapers and the skyscraper building industry that, you know, isn't really tied to all that many other industries is the sort of symbolism behind everything that you're building. And so that's kind of why, you know, we see this shift towards building these mega buildings in in other parts of the world is because these other parts of the world wanted that that same sort of symbolic sort of power projection, wealth projection, status, reputation, status. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so key. Yeah. And, and to, to put a to, to put another point on that, there is a building that's under construction right now in Saudi Arabia called the Jeddah Tower. It was previously referred to as the Kingdom Tower. And that was projected to be the largest building, the tallest building in the world. However, construction stopped, I think, in 2018 due to labor, some political issues that were happening. So apparently construction is not happening on that. But that building was projected to eclipse the Burj Khalifa and to be, a, at I think, a full kilometer tall. So right. that, you know, that's, there's symbol, there's, there's symbolism to having a building that's a kilometer tall right. and it's lo located on the north side of Jeddah, which is a Saudi Arabian city, which is on the, the Red Sea. And it's built away from everything else because that's where they had room basically to put it. And of course there has to be political and economic capital build these things as well. And the reason mm -hmm. that you have skyscrapers generally in central business districts is because that's how you can justify the enormous cost of putting these things together is where the value of land is so high that it makes sense to construct something really expensive and really tall in these places. And of course, it also takes this sort of political will, economic will to, to, that goes along with the symbolism that you're talking about, which is that we're creating something massive and impressive here that will be known throughout the world. And even if it's not the tallest one, it adds to, as you're saying, the profile of the city, the skyline of the city, and it sort of projects power and wealth and the idea that this place is a place where you might want to do business. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if we go back to sort of our, when we were sort of breaking out the different kinds of sort of skyscrapers and, you know, there was the, you know, at least 150 meters tall and then there was the super tall and then the mega tall. This is sort of what we were alluding to, this building, the Jetta Tower, as, you know, possibly needing you know, a, a new, a new classification, a super duper tall for a better term right now, because if you remember the mega tall was, you know, that's 600 meters. Now this is, this is projected to be, you know, a thousand meters or maybe a little bit over whenever, if it ever gets completed. And that's, that's significantly taller than mega tall. So that, that, and that, that's no accident. Nobody just winds up as being you know, over a kilometer tall. They didn't, you know, that was obviously very intentional. Um, and there's also probably some regional sort of one-upsmanship going on between Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which, you know, they're, they're obviously very close to each other and they compete in a lot of ways. So for Saudi Arabia to want to build a tower taller than the Burj Khalifa, you know, that, that's not for nothing. <laughs> you know, there's another aspect that we can talk about here since we're talking about this, you know, this ongoing competition, this race to have the tallest building. And there's a term I, can, I stumbled across when I was doing research on the with the information from the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. And that's something called vanity height. Have you, did you run across that term? No, I didn't. Tell me what that is. So vanity height is the height difference between a skyscraper's tallest point, which is often a spire of some kind, and the highest usable floor. Okay, so so it, yeah. it, the vanity height is the height that can't be occupied, in other words. And so for the Burj Khalifa, for example, the, the pinnacle height is 829 meters, truly massive. And the top floor height is 605 meters, which is also really tall. But that means that there's 224 meters that's, that falls into this category of what the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat calls vanity height, which is 27% of the building. Wow. Okay. So um, that's actually, that's a lot. That's a lot of building. Right. <laughs> so if you compare that, for example, with the World Trade Center, which you know, doesn't exist anymore, that was had 21 percent, so it's still quite a bit and a lot of that was an antenna basically yeah for taipei 101 it was 14 percent 
For the Petronas Towers, it was 17%. For the Empire State Building, it was 16%. For the Chrysler Building, it was 14%. So it seems that as buildings have gotten taller, part of the way that this height has been achieved is by something called vanity height, which is you know adding design aspects which aren't necessarily inhabitable. Having said that, the Burj Khalifa, by any of those three definitions that we gave at the beginning, would be the tallest building. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's so it's, massive. It's still massive, even yeah. for the occupied height is truly, truly tall. Yeah. I mean, I have here in my notes, you know, talking about the one one World Trade Center, which is Freedom Tower. It's the one that does exist now, built sort of, you know, I don't know, 10 years or so ago at this point. And so the the height of that building is, you know, 1,776 feet. Obviously, again, you don't just end up on that number. There's a lot of symbology, you know, built into sort of, you know, when the U.S. became, you know, became its own country or signed the Declaration of Independence, rather. And, you know, that that is reached due to an antenna. So I'm not sure what the breakdown is, but obviously, you know, the symbology gets wrapped up into just whatever the highest point is and however they can sort of justify that. You know, um, we also we also talked about how the buildings are looking a lot different, right? Like mm-hmm. they're, they're not so boxy necessarily. And um, one of the, the ways that that's been achieved is that the the walls of skyscrapers oftentimes now are not load bearing anymore like the, the building supports its own weight and they have what are called curtain walls mm-hmm. which is the sort of the facade the outer and covering of a building which aren't designed to, to 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 hold structural weight but rather you know it keeps people from falling out of the buildings keeps weather from coming into the buildings but this is another change you can use much lightweight lighter weight materials and you know glass facades and all these kinds of things. So that is another way of understanding how skyscrapers have changed a little bit over time is that you have the the facades which are are part of the design and part of what's going on, but they don't they're not expected to carry the load of the weight of the building. Often. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I think that makes sense, right? I I've seen some very I mean some very interesting designs. Lately, you know, I, I'm picturing one building. I'm not sure what it, where it's at exactly. I saw a picture of it, but it's basically like almost a spiral. It starts to spiral on 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 the way up. And I mean, I, I'm not an architectural engineer, but I imagine that that would be very hard to have that those walls as it spirals up to to be load bearing. So just very interesting. And and I think you know, true to your point, Hunter, I think you know that's how we're getting some of these very interesting designs these days. Is they've they've manufactured, they figured out a way to have the load bearing parts not not be the walls and therefore now you know every building can be far more iconic there's there's just one other thing that i want to sort of talk about before we jump to maybe our our our, our next section which is and we started talking about sort of this competition between cities or comparing cities and there's actually a way there's actually an index that's sort of used at least in in this, this side of the world north america to sort of measure how well cities are performing against each other and this is something called the crane index hunter do you know what the the crane index is uh, I believe it's a measure of how many cranes are active in different cities or, or something yeah. related to that. that. That's almost exactly right. So it's from this this company called the uh, Ryder Levitt Bucknell. Bucknell. It's a construction organization and, and probably a consulting firm. But they basically measure sort of where cranes are at any given quarter of the year. And so they they've created this sort of index where they show, you know, cities across sort of really the Caribbean, Mexico, the United States, and Canada. So there might be variations of this, you know, in, in other places as well, but this is just for North America. And then they sort of show, okay, where, where are we seeing an increase in cranes? Where are we seeing a cranes sort of hold steady in their count? And where are we seeing a decrease in, in cranes? And the idea is to show really what's the, what's the economic sort of, how's the economies of these individual cities doing, right? Because the idea is that if you have more cranes in your city, that means there's more stuff being built, more tall buildings. Now, granted, a crane isn't always used for a skyscraper. In fact, that's right. Most of the time they're not. But I think it's an interesting way of how we are sort of using the symbology of buildings to now be sort of also an economic indicator of success and wealth. And so, you know, they have a fun map, you know, you can you can go onto the website. It's rlb.com under their little insight section. You can click on the map and you can sort of see, you know, hey, you know, Toronto has this many cranes versus, you know, Vancouver, BC has this many cranes, right? So it's a sort of a fun, fun way to sort of you know, measure cities. I, I think there are some debate on whether it actually is a true indicator of a city's wealth or success or economic vitality, but it's definitely an interesting way that's sort of built into everything that we're talking about today. Yeah, I, 
There was something else I read. There was a report that was generated by the that organization that we keep talking about. The oh, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban that's Habitat. The one. Right. And so in 2014, I think it was, they published something called The Competition for the Tall Skyscraper, Implications for Global Ethics and Economics. And Christopher Michelson was the author of this, who I believe is a, trained as a philosopher. And one of, the, one of the observations that was made in this publication is that that height share, you know, the amount of, of tall buildings that you have is, is more a leading indicator of economic ambition than necessarily economic achievement. So obviously there's a lot of wealth involved in building these things, mm-hmm. but there's, it also reflects, according to this report, a lot of aspiration for economic development, even more so than what's already been achieved economically. So some of that symbolic power is, it falls in aspiration. The, another thing that I wanted to mention is that we've talked about this competition, you know, for skyscrapers and the tallest one, but also the number of skyscrapers that a city has is also part of that, part of that profile of being, you know, the prestige of having lots of buildings, a large skyline with, with this kind of thing. And so the statistics I have of February, 2022, which was about a year ago, uh, 14 cities in the world had more than 100 skyscrapers. So, I mean, 100 skyscrapers is a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. There were 14 cities that that met that characterization. The, by far, the city with the most skyscrapers is Hong Kong with 518 skyscrapers. Shenzhen, China with 343 is number two on the list. And then New York City with 300 is the third on the list. The only other city on this list that is not in Asia is Chicago, which has 135. And and the rest of these are either in China, United Arab Emirates, India, Mumbai in particular, and then Kuala Lumpur. Also Bangkok, Bangkok, Thailand, and Jakarta, Indonesia. So it's interesting that these are the cities that have also the highest number of skyscrapers. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we talked a little bit about earlier about buildings that people might assume are skyscrapers, but aren't actually skyscrapers. You know, I used Phoenix as an example. And, um, you know, I'm, there's probably some people who, you know, would almost take a not maybe not offense at us, but would just sort of be taken aback a little bit that you mean my my city's tall buildings aren't skyscrapers. That's that's ludicrous. That's that's silly. That's, you know, we have a very profound, you know, pronounced skyline that's, you know, you know, X, Y, Z, right? Because a lot, a lot gets built into that, right? There's a lot of, you know, I made, I made a very clear point earlier today that, you know, this is not a, an episode about cities. However, skyscrapers and cities are, are bound together. And so there's a lot of pride from your city within various, various aspects of your city, right? And so skyscrapers happen to be one of those. And so, sort of having that number and having that amount is probably a big point of pride for a lot of these cities. And this is actually leading to, I think, maybe our our next sec, sec, segment on the environmental impacts of skyscrapers, because there's a definitely a conversation of density here. But before we do that, it's time for for some some ads, some of these lovely things that people are going to try and sell you. So we'll, we'll be right we'll back. We'll be right back. And we are back. So we are just going to sort of launch into maybe, the, you know, as 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 we reframe our episodes to to sort of our new name, these this sort of final section will always sort of I think be you know based around the geographic impacts more specifically, right? So we talk a lot about geography throughout all of this, but really, what you know, if, if geography is skyscrapers, and what is the geography there? And so I, I have a couple of different points here to make, and the first one is we we sort of alluded to this as we were, were talking about the amount of skyscrapers in each city, you know. It, the density of, of U.S. cities in particular is overall fairly low compared to its, you know, like cities in Europe and, and Asia and India and, and you know, all these you know, other places. And, and what we've done in the U.S. is is really quite interesting. So a lot of U.S. cities, if we look at the downtown area, let's take, you know, Houston, for example. Houston has a number of skyscrapers. You know, it gets very dense in a very small area. And then that density drops. And so it's really a, a very stark sort of view of, of the city. And, and, and if you're not familiar with Houston, L.A. has a very similar sort of view where you can look and you can sort of see this, you know, all these really tall buildings in a really small area surrounded by a sea of one, two, three story buildings. And, and the reason why that I, I'm bringing this up with the context of the United States is that this has actually had a huge impact on sort of the land use and the environmental sort of issues that we're dealing with a lot today. And so we know, for example, that 
you know, density is better for the environment. You know, people use less energy when they live in a denser environment for, you know, all of the things that you would expect, right? If you're living in a dense area, it's more walkable. There's probably better transit. So you're probably not going to use your car very often. It's like sort of a cascading motion. And there's another episode in here somewhere to talk more, more about density. And maybe that's when we talk about cities more specifically. But the skyscraper, like, like you had alluded to earlier, Hunter, they were sort of built inside these very specific areas that were very specifically zoned for them, which means the land value was very high there, which means they can build these really mammoth sort of skyscrapers. And it really starts, you know, getting you thinking, especially as we're talking about, you know, the number of skyscrapers in the US and Asia, there was another area that was kind of left out entirely, which was Europe. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But it, it starts to get you thinking about, well, if everywhere else within the cities was able to be denser, would there really be a need for these skyscrapers? And I, I think, and obviously we don't know, know specifically with, with, with respects to each, you know, region's geographic context, but I would, I would think no, right? Just for the, the fact of the land value in these areas where they're building these mega tall skyscrapers will probably wouldn't be as high, which means they probably wouldn't build as tall of buildings. And there would be more density everywhere, which means you wouldn't need to cram so many people into one small area for business or what have you. And that kind of leads to sort of the next point is that, well, are skyscrapers environmentally beneficial? And from my research, the answer is actually no, they're not. So according to a study out of the Nature Journal, the conclusion reached by researchers is that a chain of skyscrapers generates 140% more total emissions during their service life compared with an area with lower buildings with the same number of inhabitants, right? So this is this is drawing it directly back into sort of what we're talking about density, right? So if you have an area, one square mile or one acre, or whatever, get whatever finite area you have, and you decide to cram a thousand people into one building, one tall building, that's going to take up more energy to do that than if you were to have uh, area size, but with, you know, six buildings that have the same thousand people, for example. And a lot of this is due to really this concept of embodied energy. And that is, and Again, we, we, we've talked all about this at, up to this point, but this is all of the stuff that goes into to making these these really big buildings is is a lot. Right. So we start thinking we go back to we start thinking about the steel that's required to build these. Right. Steel is a, an incredibly energy intensive material to make, and you have to make it in really mass quantities. There's still a lot of concrete that goes into these buildings as well. Oh, my God. Yeah. Concrete. and con Yeah. And so. If you didn't know, concrete is actually one of the, as an industry, one of the most carbon pollutant industries in the world. I mean, it, it's really far up there in terms of just how much it, it contributes to sort of just the global emissions. And yeah, Hunter, you're right. You know, there's a lot of car concrete that's needed, you know, a lot of foundations that that's needed, especially because a lot of these buildings, you know, we've been talking a lot about how, how, how far up they've been built, but they actually get built below too. Right. So, you know, I, and I don't have any of the, the specific buildings off the top of my head, but, you know, as I was doing my research, it was like, OK, this building is, you know, 100 stories tall and six stories below. Right. So it's, it's a total of 106 stories. It's just six of them are, are below. And when you do that, that requires an, an incredible amount of concrete, not. And that's that's aside from all the other concrete that's needed for the rest of the building, right? Right, because there's reinforced concrete that's used. So that's steel, which is embedded within the mm -hmm. concrete, which makes it stronger, able to handle more stress. So yeah, it's absolutely something that's used extensively still. Right. Yeah. And so you can you really can't separate almost the the emissions of the steel and concrete industry from the skyscraper industry, right? Because they're so linked. And and we're talking a lot about steel and concrete, but there's also, you know, other things, glass. A lot of these buildings have a lot of glass. Glass is a also a very energy intensive material. And I think we were talking about the World Trade Center, the original World World Trade Centers, which were basically just a solid glass facade, right? Basically up and down. Whereas, you know, if you were to look at a six story building, it's it is not even half glass. It is mostly um whatever, you know, wood frame or, or, or masonry or wh whatever the material is, it's not going to be a lot of glass. And so there's just a lot that goes into this, into skyscrapers. A lot of heating now. and cooling needs to be used on buildings that are, have these glass facades, for example, as well. Exactly. The, yeah, the, so, so yeah, just carry on into the energy systems that then are needed to power these buildings. And so all of this is just getting to sort of, when I hinted at it earlier, which is 
you know, North America has a lot of skyscrapers. Asia has a lot of skyscrapers. Europe has a lot of skyscrapers. So this is not to say that there aren't skyscrapers in Europe, but if, you know, as we were running through this, astute listeners probably noticed, well, we didn't bring up, we didn't bring up, you know, Paris skyscrapers or London skyscrapers or Berlin skyscrapers or, or Madrid skyscrapers, XYZ. They have them, but all of these cities also happen to be pretty dense in their own right. And there's just not been the same kind of need or desire for them. And there's a whole host of reasons that get built into this beyond. But it really goes to show that skyscrapers maybe aren't aren't that necessary if you have the right sort of land use across your city. Yeah, there's lots of ways to achieve density, of course, and having mm -hmm. high rise buildings, which are 10 or 12 or 20. Or, I mean, I don't know. There's probably a way of, of configuring, you know, how much energy is used to construct something at which height and which is most efficient. But it turns out that the tallest buildings in the world aren't necessarily the most efficient. There was another thing I was reading about that suggested that, um, you know, COVID had this huge impact on the working world, of course, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't working in offices anymore. And skyscrapers, although, are used in for many different things, for residences to some degree, restaurants, you know, there's, there's other things as well. But that office space is, is probably the number one use of skyscrapers. So if people aren't even going to work quite as much, it also suggests, you know, what is the future of these really tall buildings, given the work home nature of business these days? I and mean, one study suggested that tall buildings may increasingly have more residential space and whether that changes things, the equation here is something that remains to be seen. But, you know, in the, in the contemporary situation right now that we're still you know, going through this pandemic, really, that has an impact on skyscrapers as well. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah, I have I have something very similar in my notes. It's like we're talking a lot about density and you know, all, all of a sudden this getting conflated with housing and everything like that. And it's like, well, most skyscrapers in the U.S. are not built for housing. That's not not all of them. You're right. They're, there's definitely some that have a lot of housing in them, but the, the majority of them have, you know, are, are, are intended for use with businesses. And so when you're building these things also just for businesses that you know, what does that mean for the overall emissions and sort of their their overall purpose, right? I think it's wrapped up into this and sort of, well, is there, you know, is, is this really necessary? You know, the amount of energy that goes into them, is it really necessary just for business that, to your point, Hunter, might not even be needed today? And I think, I think to your, I think you're right that a lot of buildings, and we're talking a lot about you know, buildings now being rehabbed or retrofitted for for residences in sort of this new era of, of needing more housing and needing less office space. But there is one sort of area that we can start talking about that is, you know, perhaps a little bit better in this regard. And that that is this concept of the wooden skyscraper. So if if we go back to sort of the early part of this episode, we might have you might have, you might remember that we hinted at sort of wooden skyscraper or wooden buildings, you know, sort of topping out at I think like five or six stories. And that that is for the simple fact that wood can only bear so much weight before it just collapses onto itself. But there is now a new technology that sort of enables wood buildings to go much higher. And this is something called cross laminated timber buildings. And I have here, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole industry that's sort of being built around it. But, you know, it's uh, cross laminated timber is an engineered wood product that consists of layer of kiln dried dimension timber that's oriented at sort of right angles. So it's sort of like st structurally fitting into each other and essentially then like glued all around it. Right. So if you think about something that's laminated, right, it's like goes to this little machine, and it's piece of paper and it comes out the other side. And it's like this now plastic, like sort of durable thing. Right. That's kind of basically what they're doing with with it, with with lumber, with timber. And what this allows for is um, uh, this material, this this lumber material that is still has sort of the flexibility of wood without the the weight limits attached to it, because now it's much stronger. So it gets closer to steel in that regard. And this is far more energy efficient. CLT timber or cross laminated timber timber buildings are far more energy efficient than steel frame buildings because while there's still an energy portion there, you still obviously you need to cut down trees and all this other stuff. There, It's just the, the steel industry is very energy intensive. Although this probably has, you know, it, it probably uses a lot of plastic, which if you remember, we, we cover it pretty extensively in our what if a plastic didn't exist episode. Um, and so we don't need to spend too much time here on sort of cross laminated timber building. But I did have here in my notes that the current tallest is is a building called the Ascent MKE building. It is in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Wisconsin, and it is 284 feet tall, and it was built just in 2022. And so 
that does not quite hit our marker for a skyscraper, right? 492 feet is what, what is sort of technically required. So it's still a couple hundred feet away from that. However, if you go back even five or 10 years, cross laminated timber buildings were, were just hitting 10 stories tall. 11 stories tall. And so this is, this is, I believe, 24 stories tall. And so it's, it's starting to get up there, right? And, and I think we're going to still see these buildings built taller and taller. And that'll have some interesting connotations for, you know, what, what is a skyscraper and, you know, all of this, all these kinds of definitions that might be coming down our way, as well as, you know, maybe there's a better and a more efficient way to build tall buildings for, for housing and maybe even offices into the future. And so with that, any final notes on skyscrapers, Hunter? Any final well, thoughts? I mean, I, I would return to this this study that I was reading that I that had me thinking and it talked about some of the ethical dimensions of building mm -hmm. skyscrapers and that there's a quote here from Christopher Michelson. It reads, symbolic power in the form of an iconic skyscraper can be purchased, unlike substantive progress on human well-being measures. So, you know, there... It's not to say that skyscrapers might not have their role, but there's an enormous amount of resources that go into building a very tall building. And we could ask ourselves, you know, is there other way to use those resources? And one example comes from the Jetta Tower itself, which we talked about earlier is if it were ever completed, where it would become the tallest building in the world, a kilometer tall. And it's being constructed in an area that experienced extensive floods in 2019, which caused people to die, a lot of damage. And it's basically related apparently in part because it lacked a basic drainage system. And so here we're putting in this incredible marvel of, of technology and engineering in a place that doesn't really have basic drainage in which people are suffering from. So, you know, the ethical implications of that all over the world is something that we can consider. I'm not sure I know I don't have all the answers, but posing these kinds of questions, I think, is probably useful for our consideration of where the future of skyscrapers should be heading. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, we've talked a lot about the the symbolism, you know, the, the power and wealth projection behind these, and that's coming as as everything does in a capitalist society or capitalist world. It's coming at the expense of something else, right? I mean, that's 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 true for the U.S. as well. And we use Jetta Tower, but it's true for U.S. as well, when a, a big building is being built in your city, you know, there's a lot of, well, it might be privately funded in some some capacity. There's probably also a lot of municipal services and municipal or state dollars that are going into that as well. And so it makes you think, well, what is the purpose of that building and what could it be better spent on? Because there's a lot of other problems that cities and states have that, and one of them is probably we don't have enough skyscrapers. <laughs> Well, I mean, maybe as a final way to kind of get towards a wrapping up point, and one of the things I was reflecting on, and I don't know if you were thinking about this, is the role that skyscrapers have in science fiction. Oh, and that's science a good one. fiction is a way of of talking about concerns that people have about the world today, and then sort of hiding that wrapped up in a story about the the distant future, not so distant future. And two of the movies that come to mind where skyscrapers figure really prominently, one of them is Metropolis, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, I think a 1929 film by Fritz Lang made in Germany. And the, the, the buildings, there's the hierarchy of powers at the top of these buildings. And it's a city where planes are flying around and everything. And it's, it's sort of set the template for a lot of more contemporary films. And, and then of course, I think about Blade Runner when I think about right. skyscrapers and I think about movies mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, also the sort of lack of power that people have. This, this is a world in which the environment has been decimated. People are trying to get off the planet and the, the poorest people in both these films are at the bottom of the skyscrapers on the ground level. And those with power are sort of at the top of these buildings and that symbolizes their their hierarchy in society as well. So it's it's interesting to reflect on how fiction and science fiction in this case can can give us some food for thought for thinking about the actual world that we live in. Yeah. I think that's a great thing to sort of end on. <laughs> so Hunter, you want to run through some pluggables? Sure. I'm Hunter Shobi. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I'm co-author with David Bannis of Portlandist, a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, 
a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. Yeah. And once again, my name is Jeff Gibson. You can find me on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff. And you can find both Hunter and me on as well as this podcast. And that's geography is everything.substack.com. There will be some sort of exclusive content coming that to that community here pretty soon. So if you really like what we're doing, please go subscribe there. We would really appreciate it. And it's a way for us to interact with you all a little bit more. We have a couple of really awesome episodes coming up after this. So just to give you all just a little bit of a tease, you know, we are working on some episodes around sort of geography is beer, which will be really fun. I think Hunter and I especially really love beer. So, or at least I really love beer. We have some, yeah, we have some coming up here on sort of regional dialects, which I think will be a lot of fun to explore. And then for all of you sports fanatics out there, we are working on some soccer related episodes because probably more so than most sports, soccer is truly geographic in scale. In, in global scale, I should say. So we are really looking forward to that. But until next time, which is just next week, we'll see you around. Thank you for listening. <laughs>